Welcome to another Barcelona Java user group meetup. Today, we are going to talk about the structure programming and project loom with Ron Prestler. But first, a little bit about us. We are a bunch of people interested in any kind of technology. We are also a nonprofit association with more than 1,800 members in Meetup and growing every day. We are very open and curious about technology. We always love to learn more about technologies and try different approaches while exchanging our experiences and ideas with the software community. We help to grow the deaf community organizing meetups like this one and also encouraging developers to share and participate. Follow us in Meetup, Twitter, or Instagram and know about our next events. You will find our sessions recorded in YouTube. Subscribe. Those are a short example of the different technologies that you will see and you will know more about it in our meetups. We also organize a big conference, the JBC and Conf, with almost 800 attendees and international speakers. Let me share with you some moments of the conference to let you see how amazing it was to attend. We are very proud to organize it and make it available for the community, from developers to developers, something that we would like for ourselves. And all of that was possible with hard work of organizers and volunteers. It was really amazing. For the situation of this, of this year, it was not possible to do it on site, but we managed to do it online with huge success, with more than 1,000 registrations. And for next year, I'm so happy to announce that the JVC and Conf returns again on site. So in July 18 to 20, keep tuned for when the tickets will be available. We are back to on-site events. Our next meetup will be next week on November 3rd at Tocado Technology with the speakers, Joanna Socrates and one of our co-founders, Jonathan Villa. I want to thank you very much to our today's sponsor, Weekend Desk, for providing the Zoom account. If you want to contribute and participate in the community, the best way is to contact us by email or joining directly over Slack, where you'll be able to speak with us directly. And finally, I'm very proud to introduce Ron Pressler. Ron is the technical lead for OpenJDK Project Loom at Oracle, with six to add lightweight threats to the JDK. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Ron, to be here and share with the Java community your amazing work and for being here today. Thank you, Alejandro, for inviting me, and uh, it's uh, great to have an opportunity to speak to you. Um, so I'm, uh, as uh, Alejandro said, I'm uh, Ron Pressler. I'm the technical leader of Project Loom. I work at the uh, Java platform group at Oracle. Uh, most of the session I have planned for today is going to be Q&A. Um, and uh, it will give you an opportunity to, rather than just giving the same talk over and over, which you can watch online, uh, I prefer in these uh, circumstances to be more interactive and to let you ask me any question you like about Loom or perhaps even other job related questions, and I will do my best to answer them. Uh, and also, I want to say that uh, the Java platform group at Oracle is hiring in the US, Europe, and Asia. So uh, if that sounds interesting to you, uh, and it should be, uh, then you can uh, ask me about this too. Um, but first, uh, I want to spend uh, maybe the first half hour, maybe less, we'll see, uh, to talk about a subject called structure concurrency, which I had mentioned in previous talks, but uh, you're going to be the first to see some of the things we've uh, worked on recently. So uh, as I hope uh, you already know, Project Loom um, 
allows us to create a great many threads, which in itself uh, already can make some problems with writing concurrent code easier. But we thought that uh, while we're there, we might try to take the opportunity to help even more. And there are opportunities opened by um, uh, open to us by uh, the possibility of creating that many virtual threads. Um, so let me start with uh, setting the stage and, and I want to see, um, and please ask me questions if you don't understand. Uh, part of it is for me as well to see if uh, the way I explain it um, is good enough and uh, also to hear what you think about it. Um, so in the early decades of computer programming, people used to code in languages like assembly and Fortran. And their code suffered from uh, very common pitfalls. Much of it was because of a very pervasive use of jump instructions or go to instructions, which made uh, the flow of the program uh, very unclear and hard to reason about. Uh, for example, you were looking at a piece of code and it wasn't clear how you could get there. Maybe you know you came from the top, but maybe somebody jumped in into the middle. Um, another thing was that uh, operations, and and this is you know even today these days in C or even Go, um, operations various operations could fail, and it was possible to just ignore the failure, which led to bugs perhaps uh, somewhere further further away from the from where the uh, failure occurred. Um, and uh, so, so they had these problems and uh, they realized, and they came up with various best practices to avoid them. And later on, they realized that um, some of those best practices could be, um, uh, could be codified as changes to the language. Uh, and this is where I'm going to start. Uh, Alejandro, can you uh, allow me to share the screen? Okay. Um, right, so uh, this is when um, they came up with what we now know as structured program. So the best practices uh, for writing the, the code were, were codified into the language itself. Um, and what does structure mean? So structure means that the flow of the program, how when it executes, is reflected in the structure of the code in the syntax. So you can look at uh, code blocks in your program syntax and see where you, know, where you can enter a certain block, where you can exit it, uh, and things that we now take for granted. Uh, additionally, um, we, so, so in, instead, of, instead of various uh, you know, uh, arbitrary go to instructions, we now have uh, you know, for loops and break statements continue statements, which are sort of restricted forms of go-to, and that they make the flow of the program clear. Uh, in addition, um, exceptions and maybe other kinds of uh, error handling as well, made it mandatory to for programs to uh, handle the error conditions so they couldn't ignore them. Um, so these constructs, these structure con constructs, made the program easier to understand and, and this is this is another interesting point I think that many some people overlook. Uh, not just when you read the code on the page, but also when uh, you run the program and debug it. And let me show. Uh, let me uh, let me uh, tell you what I mean here. Um, so because our programs now are structured into subroutines or Java methods. Um, when we debug the program, when we want to inspect it, the, that structure also uh, is also apparent to us when we observe the program as it runs, right? We can get a stack trace, uh, either with exceptions or uh, you know, just getting a thread done or in the debugger. So the structure is not just something that affects the syntax, but it helps us give, it helps us give uh, better um, a better experience when observing a running program. Uh, the problem is that concurrent code, so this works for sequential code, but uh, concurrent code, um, 
suffers from common pitfalls. Some of them are quite similar to the early ones that we had in sequential programming. Uh, and we don't quite have uh, a solution yet for those. So uh, threads are uh, a reasonable unit of concurrency. So uh, a thread represents a piece of code that's running sequentially alongside other threads. Uh, but whereas subroutines do have certain relationships with one another. So a subroutine can call another subroutine. And we can see that in the code and we can see that in the stack trace that uh, different threads can have interesting relationships between them. But um, our current tooling does not allow us to, to see them so clearly. In fact, um, but for example, one thread can wait on a lock held by another, can wait for a message from another, but that is not something that's built into the language and the tooling. Um, so we have various good practices on how to write good concurrent code, uh, but we have not yet um, codified them. So to illustrate um, what we gain from structure, let me start with sequential code. So um, suppose you have this, um, this foo method, uh, and it is uh, called in your uh, HTTP server, in your web server, uh, while as, as, as part of uh, handling a request. So you get an HTTP request, do some stuff, and then you call foo. And foo needs to uh, return you back some information that maybe you want to send back to the user in, in the form of a string. Now, foo uh, decides that it doesn't want to do all the work alone. Uh, it wants to call bar and baz. And more than that, you're using perhaps microservices. So bar and baz, what they really do is they contact uh, two different microservices that give foo uh, part of its answer. So foo gets uh, an integer from bar, a string from Baz, and then combines them, and that's the result it returns. Um, these calls can fail. And uh, so uh, they might throw exceptions. They might take some time. This whole operation can be, can be interrupted. But let's see um, what we gain from structure, the structure we have in sequential code. So suppose the call to Bar fails with an exception. Um, something bad happens. Uh, that will cause foo automatically to cancel, right? That exception will propagate back to foo. Foo can decide to catch the exception or it can decide to pass it along. But the, the relationship that foo is responsible for the uh, exceptions that bar throws is very clear and it's part of the structure of the code. Um, if some other thread wants to cancel says, okay, I don't know, some, something bad happened to the session. It wants to cancel uh, the, the, our interaction with the user that's called to foo. Um, and it's going to interrupt the thread running foo. So if bar is now running, the code that runs in bar will be interrupted uh, because foo and bar are related. Uh, finally, if while bar is running, we obtain a thread dump to see what our program is doing, what we're going to find is we're going to see bar called in one of the threads and we're going to see foo right below it. So we know that bar is doing its work on behalf of foo. It's, it's doing um, a part of the work that foo is doing. So this is what uh, we gain from structure for sequential code. But now we look at this and we say, okay, bar and baz go to two different services and they're unrelated, right? Baz does not need anything from bar. So we might as well, instead of doing them one after another over the network, let's do them concurrently. So let's see what Java gives us to do it concurrently. So we're going to write that code. Let's look at it for a moment. So we have some executor service that would usually represent some thread pool, right? And we submit uh, the call to bar and a call, call to baz to them. And then they're going to... Uh, to be called on some other thread. Uh, each of them will return us a future that will allow us to wait for them and obtain their results. And then we're going to say, okay, I'm going to wait for Baz to return, for Bar to return, and um, this is the result we have. But of course, they can fail, and the future class uh, interface rather uh, also 
handles this, this um, uh, error propagation. So if bar or baz fail, uh, the call to get will throw an exception wrapped inside an execution exception, and then we can handle it. Um, now this code is correct. I, I don't want to, to, to highlight bugs here. And in fact, because it is correct, it is interesting because um, it's quite simple. It is correct, but let's see uh, what we lose here. Uh, compared to compared to uh, what we had before. So even though we are disciplined in our handling of errors, so uh, if baz or bar fail, we will catch the error and handle it. Notice something that interesting that happens here. Uh, in order to return successfully, we need both baz and bar to complete normally. Right, so if either one of them fails, we want to fail. Uh, so our result depends on both of them. But we wait for Baz first. And Baz can take a while, and it's possible that during that time, Bar fails, throws an exception. And that, in that case, we know that there is nothing else for us to do other than throw an exception, but we're going to miss it here because we're still waiting for Baz. So rather than canceling Baz and Bar together, as soon as Bar fails, we will first have to wait for Baz to complete and only then will we notice that Bar has failed. Uh, why did this happen? It happened because Baz and Bar are uh, isolated, they're, they're independent. The, the future mechanism doesn't know that, we're, that we care about both of them. All it knows is that right now we care about Baz. So, we don't have the relationship between them. Another thing is that suppose um, somebody wants to interrupt us. So it says, okay, uh, for some reason, I don't know, the session with the user closed, I want to interrupt the thread running foo. So it's going to interrupt the thread running foo. What's going to happen? Uh, the call to get um, either this one or that one will throw an interrupted exception, which is fine, but the operations in those two other threads will continue running. So they will not be interrupted, even though once they complete, all they can do is return their answers to the void. Nobody cares, foo's gone. Uh, why does this happen? Because the relationship between foo and baz and bar is not clear. Baz and bar only work to help foo. But if we cancel foo, if we interrupt foo, uh, that doesn't get propagated because this mechanism doesn't know that they're related. Uh, Maybe it's possible that there could be some other thread that's also waiting for uh, Baz and Bar. Uh, there is no sense of ownership. So the future says, I wait for someone else to finish, but it doesn't mean that I own them. It doesn't say that um, uh, they exist only to serve me, right? So uh, that is one drawback. Okay. Finally, um, even though Baz and Bar do their work only because foo asked them to, right? So foo submitted them. If we get a thread dump to see, to, uh, to ask, hang on, what is my program doing? And said, as before, we are currently running bar, bar. What we will see is we will see one thread running foo, one thread running bar, one thread running baz, and we won't see any relationship between them. They're going to be on the same level and completely independent. And that too is because even though we're using best practices here and programming correctly, we're not telling the runtime, the relationship between bar, baz, and foo. So it's like foo is the parent and bar and baz are sibling that belong to it. Okay, so uh, just as the, the good practices developed for uh, sequential code later on were codified in the language, and that is what allowed us to get better observability in that case, stack traces, uh, we can do the same for uh, concurrent program. And that is where structured concurrency comes in. So uh, the term was coined by uh, Martin Sostrick and it was popularized by Nathaniel J. Smith. And I'm going to paste uh, these two links into the chat so you can go to them. I would very much recommend uh, reading at least the second one by, Nathan by Nathaniel J. Smith. It is one of the most convincing blog posts I've, I've read 
perhaps ever. Um, so, uh, and, and the idea is, is actually quite simple of structured concurrency. It means that if our program runs sequentially and then it splits to do several things concurrently, it must rejoin in the same code block. Okay, so that, that is what structured concurrency basically means, but I'll show you the implications. All right, so uh, there are many ways to, to express structured concurrency as an API. Uh, one of the, the uh, what we've decided to do in Project Loom is not to try to have a definitive structured concurrency API, uh, but to have uh, sort of a uh, suggestion. So we do have an API, which I'm about to show you for uh, structured concurrency, uh, but uh, we do have some low level mechanisms that will allow uh, third party libraries to perhaps write their own structured concurrency um, constructs. So let's see what we have. Uh, what we have is called task session. And what we try to do, uh, I, I said that there are many ways to do structured concurrency. Uh, there are ways that are more, that are more clever maybe that do more for you. Uh, we try to find a balance between power and uh, familiarity. So it was important to us that using this API will be familiar to people who work with concurrent code in Java. And you'll see in a moment why that is. Uh, in particular, it's supposed to be quite similar to executor service. So a task session um, has a sort of a life cycle uh, and it is, uh, it's something very lightweight. It's supposed to be created and opened and closed in the same method. And it's supposed to do it without thinking about it. Every time you want to, to do multiple things, you create a task session and then you close it. Uh, when you create it, you can give it a name, which then in obser observability tools, you'll be able to see. So if, if you have a bunch of friends doing some work, you can say those friends are part of a certain group um, uh, in a way and give it a name. And uh, you can also give it uh, a thread factory that will be used to run the task you give it. I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, the next thing you do, so you open the session, you say, I'm about to do multiple things in, uh, concurrently. And then you start forking. Fork is very similar to executor service uh, submit. It gives you back a future. And uh, what a fork will do is that it will start a new thread to run the task you give it. And that, and it's going to use a thread factory. By default, uh, if you don't give it your own thread factory, it will use a thread factory that creates virtual threads. So, uh, the right thing with the virtual threads, we don't use uh, thread pools anymore. Uh, you should never pull them, uh, but uh, for every task you create a new. So this is what fork does. The second version allows you to, um, uh, to refactor some common patterns, which I'll show you in examples. Um, and then those, those forks run um, and they can uh, all run to completion. Um, and we can wait for them to complete. Uh, and this is what await complete does. But um, each of them can say, uh, you know what? We have all the information we need. I want everyone to complete right now. Uh, this is similar to, so this is the uh, concurrent now analogous to a break segment in a for loop, right? So um, if you have code after the for, for loop, uh, either you wait for all the, um, all the iterations to finish or the for loop calls break, and it, it, it breaks out of the for loop early. So this is complete. Um, as you'll see in some examples, complete says, uh, no need to wait for everyone. Uh, I have all the information I need. And then uh, uh, a wait complete will wait either for all the tasks to finish or uh, for one of them to call complete. And then you can continue. Uh, and then when you're done, you close, but of course it's an auto-closable, so it's done to you implicitly. So let's look at examples. Uh, and I'll start with the example we started with. So this does uh, something very similar to the example before with an executor service. Uh, but, uh, so we open, we open a task session, uh, but uh, this is a very common pattern and it's so common that uh, we've made a helper class 
uh, to to um, to define sort of the cancellation cancellation strategy for this case. And in this case, uh, as I said before, we want both Bar and Baz to complete successfully. So if either one of them, if you remember before, the trouble was that if Bar failed first, then we wouldn't notice it until Baz finished. Uh, so here we say, if any of them fail, uh, call complete. Because we're done, we know that the entire thing has failed. Um, so this says, uh, so this is a policy. You don't have to use it. It's very easy to write your own. Uh, we have two built-in policies that we provide you with. Um, so this one is complete and first failure. The first one that, that uh, fails, we'll call complete. And uh, we say, okay, we have all we need. We know that in this case, then it's failed. So we fork bar and bars as we did before. And then we wait for them uh, both to finish normally or for the first one to throw an exception. Um, and then, as before, we need to uh, handle the exceptions. Uh, we have some helper methods here. This API might change by the time you see it. But uh, we say, if it's an IO exception, we just want to propagate it. Otherwise, we'll wrap it with a runtime exception. And then we return the results. But uh, these are futures. Instead of calling get, which uh, blocks and throws uh, checked exceptions, uh, we already waited. We already waited for both of them to complete, and we know so we know that both tasks are finished. Uh, so we've added um, new methods to uh, the future interface result now and exception now that says, uh, "We know you're finished. Just give me the result without waiting. Uh, and if I'm wrong, then you know it throws an error. But uh, so this means uh, I know you, I know you have the result. Give it to me. So this is how we do that. Uh, let me show you another example. Uh, let's say we get a list of callable tasks and we want to run all of them and return a list with all the results. And if either, if any of them fails, uh, then we fail. So we only want to succeed if all of them succeeded. So we use the same, uh, we use the same um, policy as before, complete on first failure, because if any of them fails, then we're done. Uh, and then, uh, we map on the tasks for each of them. We fork inside the session. We use this handler uh, and we get a list of futures. Then we wait for everyone to finish or to one of them throw, to throw an exception. If there is an exception, we just propagate it. Otherwise, uh, we now have a list of completed futures. Um, we just obtain the results and map them to a list. But this, as in the previous example, was a case where we wanted to get all the results. There are also cases where uh, we only care about one of the results. So uh, I call that a race. So you have uh, um, one example of it that we've been using internally is um, say a DNS uh, um, resolver gives you back uh, an IP address for a host name and it gives you back several addresses. And so you try to connect concurrently to all of them or to some of them, but you only care about the first one that succeeds. So you want them to race each other and you only care about the result of the first one. So the difference in this case is that we now want to use a different policy. We want to stop early to break or complete, in the, as we call it, on the first success rather than on the first failure. And we only want to fail if everyone has failed. But if one succeeded, we're done. So, uh, and to make things more interesting, uh, let's say we want to give it a timeout. So what we want to do is we get a list of tasks. We want to run them all. And we're interested in the first one that succeeds, but we only give it a certain time. So if none of them have succeeded by that time, uh, we will fail. We'll throw a timeout exception. So, um, we forked all of them and we said the first one that succeeds will complete. Uh, and then we await uh, and we give it a timeout. So this will wait either the first one that happens, either one of them completes successfully and calls complete, uh, the timeout expires, or all of them fail. And then in which case it will wait for all of them to finish. All of them said, you know, I failed, I, I couldn't, I don't know, resolve the address, the all thrown exception. Um, 
and then we can continue. All the concurrent paths have now joined. And then we say, give me the results, or if you don't have any, uh, throw an experiment. And that is all I had to show you.